Amen. We turn to Numbers, Numbers chapter 6, if you would. And I think this week we're supposed to start Numbers, on, started with number 7 last week, but I'm going to go ahead and cover number 6. I'm even going to throw in a, a verse that is on this week's Bible reading schedule, so I'm messing us all up. But I just read past this, and I'm, I'm sure I've touched on this before in the past for one reason or another. I can't remember the occasion, but it's the Nazarite vow. Probably last year when we went through the Bible. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I uh, probably touched on this. But as I'm reading that, it always kind of intrigues me. And so I wanted to just study that out a little bit and kind of bring up some thoughts and preach a message tonight on the Nazarite vow. So let's just go ahead and read this chapter. It's a... It's not super long, but just kind of bear with me as I read this. Numbers chapter 6, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. Now, I don't know what the exact word means, but the word Nazarite has something to do with being separated, and that's why uh, all these verses talk about separation. Verse 3, he shall separate himself from, here are some things that he needs to separate himself from, wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor, and that means any liquor, not just meaning uh, alcoholic, but uh, actually, the, if you look up the word, study the word liquor, it just talks about the, uh, uh, the juice that comes from something. And the funny thing is, first time I ever heard that, uh, uh, Brother Fight, Valerie's grandpa, was a missionary in El Salvador. And, uh, and I remember one time he, we were at his house eating, and, he, and he, when all the beans are gone, what's left in the bowl is just the juice from the beans, you know? And he said, oh, that's the bean liquor. And I remember when he said that, I thought he was like calling it alcoholic, just being funny or something like that. And then later on, I realized liquor just has to do with that, which comes out of the fruit. Okay, so uh, anyway, not being liquor, but, uh, but uh, the liquor of the grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried, no raisins, unfortunately, I love raisins, uh, all the days of his separation, I mean, I'm not under a Nazarite vow, but <laughs> shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there. Uh, here's another thing he needs to separate himself from. Shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in the which he separated himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy. That's the same idea as separated or set apart, and shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow all the days of his separate of, of uh, that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. All right, so not to get anywhere near a dead body. Uh, he shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother or his brother or his sister when they die because of the consecration of uh, uh, of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. And if any man die very suddenly by him, or he hath defiled uh, the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he shave it. And on the eighth day, he shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, uh, in all in all, well, this sounds weird, but if you read through already in Leviticus, uh, you've seen some of these kinds of things, and this is just the way God put it in order. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make an atonement for him for, he, for, for that he sinned by the dead, right? Kind of like an unknowing sin or an accidental sin, not a, uh, what's the word the Bible uses? Uh, huh? Willful? Willful, I think there's another word I'm looking for, uh, type sin, but just kind of an unknowing sin. Uh, uh, presumption, sin of presumption. Uh, by the dead and shall hollow his head the same day. Verse 12, and he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation. And shall bring a lamb of the first year uh, uh, for a trespass offering, 
But the days that were before shall be lost because his separation was defiled. And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one you lamb of the, years, uh, of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for a peace offering, and a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their, uh, me their meat offering, and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord, and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering, and he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall offer also uh, his meat offering and his drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall take the hair of the head of his separation, and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall take the sodden shoulder of a ram, and one unleavened cake out of the basket, and one unleavened wafer, and shall put them uh, upon the hand of the Nazarite, after the hair of his separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is holy for the priest." With the, wave, uh, with the wave breast and heave shoulder, and after that the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the, of the Nazarite, who hath vowed, and of his offering unto the Lord for his separation. Beside that, uh, his hand shall get, uh, beside that his hand shall get, according to the vow which he vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, is what we talked about this morning, uh, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put thy name under the children of Israel. Uh, I'm sorry. And they shall put my name under the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Wow, interesting, interesting chapter. Once you get into all the heave offerings and the uh, sin offerings and the wave offerings and all that, man, it just gets kind of complicated. And you're thinking, man, I'm sure glad we don't live under those times where we have to go and keep up with all those things. But actually, this was a voluntary thing. This was a vow. I, I don't know. I tried to figure out like the reason, like what is a case where somebody would have made this vow? But this vow was actually a temporary thing, and it was voluntary. Somebody had to decide, I want to enter into this vow before the Lord. Maybe it's something, uh, he just said he's going to do something, and so all the time that he's under that vow and promised he was going to do that thing, he's reminding himself by being part of this vow, and, uh, and, and uh, maybe just similar to like a time of fasting, except he's going under these strict uh, you know, things that, not, that he's not to be around all, all these different things, which I'm going to explain here in a second. And then after that, he cut off his hair, and it seems kind of strange. Now, a couple things about this. There are two people in the Bible who were under that Nazarite vow from birth and apparently stayed under that Nazarite vow their whole life. And so the first one is Sam, uh, Samson. Look at Judge, Judges 13. Judges 13. Samson was supposed to be... Uh, under this vow, and I'm pretty sure it never says a Nazarite vow, but we understand that by reading the context of what, it's, what it tells him to do and not to do, it was the same kind of vow. Judges chapter uh, 13. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And this is how it is as you read through the book of Judges. God keeps raising somebody up to lead them, and uh, they see some success, and then they fall into sin, and then He has to raise somebody else to lead them again, and that sort of thing. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. 
Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Okay, and then so we see uh, verse uh, 24. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. The child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zor and Eshtol. So we see that Samson was one that was under this type of a vow. Same things that he was forbidden from doing. No fruit of the vine. Not even grapes, not even raisins. Couldn't do any of that. And interestingly, yet we end up finding him going through vineyards in the Bible. He is supposed to stay away from any dead bodies, yet we find him, you know, killing the lion and then later on coming back and eating honey out of the, bo out of the carcass and, and all that. And then, of course, we know at the very end, even gets his head shaved off. So he breaks all those vows, right? But this is something that he was supposed to be under all that time. Now, the other person who, guess who the other one is? Uh, Sam Samsel, uh, Samuel is the other one under the Nazarite vow. So look at, unless I miss somebody, I'm not thinking of, 1 Samuel chapter 1. First Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. This, you remember the story of Hannah, also somebody who wasn't able to have a child, and then God opens up her womb. And she said, uh, or she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaiden a, a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it, and it uh, came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Anyway, you can follow that, and you see uh, something that you might not have ever noticed in the drawings and the Sunday school lessons of Samuel, but no razor was supposed to come upon his head, right? And so uh, that's an interesting, uh, interesting thing. We do also see somebody under the Nazarite vow in the, in the New Testament. Look at Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. For whatever reason, we don't know what the vow was that he made or why, why he made it. But Paul entered into this vow. Look at Acts 18. In verse 18, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centuria, for he had a vow. You know, you put two and two together reading the Bible, you say, well, why did he shave his head? Well, he must have been under this vow. Now, I don't know how long he was under the vow, so how long did his hair actually get? Probably not like Samuel and uh, Samson, who, who would have not ever had a razor cut their head, so they had these long locks, right? Uh, who knows how long the vow was? But when somebody decided, I'm going to take a vow, the, this was the vow of the Nazarite, Right? They're, they're going to be separated, and they're going to take this, like I said, as similar maybe to fasting for this certain amount of time to get this prayer answered. And uh, the only way then out of that vow, legally, by the Bible, look at Numbers chapter 30. Now, this is supposed to be in your reading this week, if you're following this schedule. Numbers chapter 30. Here's a good one for parents to learn, and husbands, I should say, to learn. Numbers chapter 30. And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Now here's the stipulation. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord, and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth... And her father hear her vow and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul. 
and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her, uh, her soul shall stand. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth it, heareth not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. And the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. Isn't that something? Uh, so the father, being the head of the household, the authority of the house, had the right to say, wait, 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 what are you making this vow? No, you're not going to do that. I think my mind always goes to, and as you read on, not only the father was able to inter intervene with his daughter, but also as you keep reading, you see a husband could do the same thing with his wife. And so, you know, you know the wife might, uh, you know, decide, hey, that's it. You know, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, I'm going to surrender and I'm going to give all, uh, all the money that comes in for this and that. And I just want to give it to the Lord. And the husband says, whoa, 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 whoa. You need that money. We're not going to give that to the Lord. It would be okay, right? He had the authority to do that. He, he's kind of looking at things from a different angle or maybe uh, toning down uh, his wife's zeal or, so, or his daughter's zeal or something like that. And they had the opportunity to do that. But that's the only way that you'd get out of such a vow. This was a vow unto God. I'm separating myself unto him. And I am, I am, unless it's by accident, and then there's a way to get, you know, get around that. But I am not going to... Uh, have any fruit of the vine. I'm not going to cut my hair. I'm not going to come at any dead bodies, where I think probably any dead thing at all was the idea. And, uh, and, and because it's unclean, and during my time of the vow, I'm not going to do any of those things. And so you got to ask yourself, like, what was the reason for these particular things? What's so bad about grapes? What's so bad? I mean, why in the world would you uh, let your hair grow out long? If you're a guy, I mean, you know, that's, isn't that a bad thing to do? And so let's look at those one by one and give some examples. Uh, one of the things I want to mention is this, and this kind of go along with each one of these points, but some people have made this mistake. I'm not sure where this entered into history. Some people made the mistake of saying that Jesus was a Nazarite, and therefore they assumed that he was under this vow, and so, therefore, the pictures and the paintings show him with this long, flowing hair that has never been cut. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible, <laughs> okay? And so I'm going to explain that a little bit uh, as we go on. All right, so number one, it said there's no fruit of the vine. Uh, you read it, no grapes, no, uh, uh, no strong drink, which I don't know exactly. Uh, there's different uh, opinions as to what that means exactly, but you know, probably other vine fruit as well, not just grapes, uh, but there are some other things as well. And, uh, and he wasn't able to, to do any of those things. And here's an interesting thing, talking about Jesus not being a Nazarite. Well, did Jesus ever drink from a grape, something that was made from grapes? <laughs> Right? Of course. Now, he turned water into wine. We don't necessarily see in John 2 that he drank that wine. And when I say wine there, that's kind of like the idea of the liquor. We're talking about just the juice from the grape. People get bent out of shape and they, oh, he drank alcohol. I don't believe that's the case, but I'm not going to preach that in this message. That's for another day. But, uh, but he drank, obviously, from the fruit of the vine. Uh, he even said of the Pharisees out there, he said, when John the Baptist came... Neither eating or drinking, you said, uh, you said he has a devil, right? And then the Son of Man came, referring to himself, and he says he comes eating and drinking. You say, behold, a glutton and a wine bibber, right? So obviously they had seen him drinking wine, and if that's not enough to convince you, how about the Lord's Supper where he says, take, this is the cup, <laughs> right? And uh, so he's, he's clearly uh, not against drinking any uh, grape juice or what have you. Okay, so, uh, so here are some possible reasons, maybe. I mean, I'm just kind of making, making some guesses here. Some possible reasons why these particular things in the uh, vow. Why would he say no fruit of the vine? Now, one thing would be a possibility, all right, just thinking this through here. One possibility could be uh, you're wanting to be pure, holy, separated, and so maybe let's stay away from any appearances of evil, right? How do they know that that wine is not alcoholic? How do they know? I'm just thinking this is one possibility. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
Or let me just read this one to you. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 says, Abstain from all appearances of evil. I was just talking this afternoon about how, I don't remember how it came up, but I was talking about how my wife uh, likes to cook, and I'm glad that she does, and I like her to cook, and she cooks good, good food. But uh, one thing that a lot of recipes calls for is cooking wine. And, you know, it probably makes it taste real good. And I've had stuff with it in there, and alcohol cooks out, and so it's good, and it tastes really good. But you know what my wife doesn't want to do? She doesn't want to go to the store and buy some wine and put it in the cart and check out and just say, well, I don't care what they think, right? You know, I know that I'm not drinking it. I'm just using it for cooking. No, she wants to stay away from appearances of evil. And so she says, that's not going in the cart, right? <clears throat> she sends me out at midnight. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, we don't do that. We don't want it to be seen. Uh, it's not worth it, ruining a testimony or something like that. So I think there's a great... Uh, point to be made there on just staying away from appearances of evil. And look at this, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3. Now remember, the leader of a church, the bishop or the uh, elder, as they're called, or pastor, uh, it's supposed to be leading by example, okay? And so they're supposed to be trying their best to, uh, to, to live separated lives. And so they can set an example for everybody. And here's what it says about pastors. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. Now that's, I mean, that's impossible to be 100% without blame. But you see the idea. He's blameless. He's not something that you can accuse him and say, oh, look at that, okay? Husband of one wife, uh, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, uh, not given to wine. You see this idea of, of uh, look, this is somebody who's not going to be just indulging, I think is one of the, the ideas. And so really, I think somebody could say this even, <clears throat> probably this application could be made even, as, even for me as a pastor, not necessarily that just that I wouldn't touch wine, alcoholic wine. Uh, nobody should be doing that, right? But also that I shouldn't be a glutton, right? Which would include not just eating too much, which I have been known to do. Sorry, I'm not. <laughs> don't kick me out of this, Pastor. Not, which I've been known to do. But not only gluttony, but, you know, it goes hand in hand with gluttony is being what's called a wine bibber, right? Which doesn't necessarily mean alcoholic, now, remember back in those days, right, it's not like everybody just had uh, grocery stores where they could go and get their beverages and, you know, hey, you get your, your, uh, your Dr. Pepper or you get your all these different things. No, you pretty much drank water, which you were at risk sometimes drinking water with all the parasites and stuff like that in there. Or you could drink uh, juice from the grapes. Or you, sometimes they would make that and it would ferment and become alcoholic, yes. But, you know, even that fresh grape, I mean, if the rich people had access to, I mean, if some of them had servants that would stand out there and crush the grapes with their feet, right? And it would go down in however it works. I don't know. That's pretty gross, isn't it? I mean, you're drinking grape juice, somebody crushed with their feet, and they, all the juice goes into there, and, and they drink that. Well, can you imagine indulging in that is kind of a bad testimony. Even if it's not alcoholic, you're just indulging in all the sweet beverage, and you're just, uh, look how luxury and, and all that. It's kind of like the equivalent of being a glutton, right? And so anyway, I think that could apply to this Nazarite vow. Uh, you're saying, hey, I'm being wholly separated apart. I'm not even going to touch anything, strong drink, uh, anything on the vine. Uh, I'm not going to drink that or even eat the, gra the grapes or even the raisins or whatever. That's a possibility. But I think that the basic idea is probably just not indulging themselves. Okay. So, so really, again, kind of like the same idea of a fast. All right. You're just saying, I'm just going to stay away from any of that. Uh, you know, at Heartland, some people took this course. I think they actually they went to another college for this. I can't remember, but it was a course that was supposed to teach them how to uh, deal with, like to minister to people that have addictions. Okay, uh, I don't remember the name of the course. But uh, so in order to, for them to understand what it's like to be addicted to something, 
They just figure, you know what, probably 99% of the people are addicted to sugar or carbs in general, breads and stuff like that. And so here's what we're going to do to give them a taste of what it feels like to try to break themselves of an addiction. They're going to have to go a certain amount of time eating no bread, no sugar. And some of these people after just a few days was like, this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> right? So now you can begin, if you do that, to understand what somebody who's become addicted to a substance, uh, you know, and they just can't help it. They just constantly crave that like you crave bread or food whenever you're hungry. And so, uh, so doing without that, making that sacrifice, puts you kind of in a different state of mind. And that's why fasting is important. But here, the idea was to do away with uh, certain luxuries, I guess, uh, like drinking beverages. Now, this one I don't consider a luxury, but you also weren't allowed to go around dead bodies. <laughs> now, I'll be honest, I cannot stand roadkill. I have literally been jogging down the street and saw a roadkill coming up ahead and ran to the other side of the street so I didn't have to look at it, didn't have to smell it. It's not because I'm under a Nazarite vow, it's just because I'm disgusted by dead things, right? I don't like a lot of skulls and bones and all that. There's this one, you know, the Prairie, uh, not the Prairie Spirit Trail, but the Lehigh Trail. I don't know if everyone's ever been on that, but that Lehigh Trail here in town, there's another trail I discovered one day. I mean, it's been there for a while, but I had never been on it, and it's the John Brown Cave part of the trail. It takes you right past John Brown Cave. And I went on that part of the trail and I'm like, I've never been on this trail before. This is really cool. And then all of a sudden it started going into this really creepy part of the... I don't know what happened. Somebody butchered their cows out there or something and their bones, cow bones, just all over in this field. And I was like, oh man, this is creepy. Like I'm running through a graveyard or something like that. And I kept running a little bit farther. Somebody had taken like cow skulls and all these things, and hung them in this tree. And I'm running through, and I'm thinking, this is not good. I shouldn't be here by myself right now. <laughs> I don't like that kind of stuff. There are some people just, you know, uh, uh, social, social media kind of reveals more about some people than you want to know about them, right? And, uh, and I got some friends uh, on Instagram where I put some drawings and stuff like that that I put in. Look, artists are, there's a lot of weird artists out there anyway. And somebody came on there and a picture uh, was like of a dead body or, or something. I don't know, not a dead body, but bones, you know? I mean, I guess it's a dead body. And <laughs> anyway, some kind of bones. And then I went on their page and you could see that they had this kind of fixation on death. And grave, they go to graves and take all these pictures of this stuff. And I thought, that's demonic. I mean, the Bible gives us examples of people that love death. It's not a good thing. <laughs> people that are like possessed and all that stuff. And I thought, got to be something wrong if you just love death and you love gore and you love horror. And you, you know, uh, there's, there's people that just can't, little bitty kids. Just watch all kind of horror and gore on TV and, and uh, you know, zombies and all that kind of stuff. And uh, really, children of God, I don't think, really should mess with that anyway. But I think one of the reasons, possible reasons for this... Oh, and by the way, let's go back to this before I go there any farther. Let's go back to the idea of Jesus being a Nazarite. Did Jesus ever come, uh, come across any dead bodies? <laughs> In uh, John 11, you see them, it says literally that he came to the tomb where Lazarus was and called him up out of the tomb, right? <laughs> Jesus, if he was under a Nazarite vow, he broke it. And the Bible he actually said there in, in number 6 that that was a sin. And so, uh, so we know that Jesus never sinned, so he was not a Nazarite. Okay, he was, a, he was from Nazareth, Nazareth. So he was a Nazarene, but he wasn't a Nazarite, Okay. All right, so, uh, so anyway, Jesus was... Uh, okay, uh, here, here's some possible reasons. Philippians 4, 8. I already mentioned how dead bodies and stuff like that is not really great, pleasant things to think about. Uh, I, I enjoy fishing. I've never been hunting, but I enjoy fishing. But, you know, uh, first time I, the first time I gutted a fish... I had nightmares about it. <laughs> I had nightmares about doing the same thing to a person. And, uh, and I remember thinking, oh, what is wrong? I, I, just, I don't ever want to do that again, right? I don't mind uh, filleting fish now and everything. But I'm just saying that's just in my mind how I've always been. Uh, I, I, would, I would love to go hunting. 
And if I go hunting, I'm not going to chicken, chicken out, man. I'm going to uh, do whatever you, hunters got to do. Or I, I'm not going to eat the heart, but maybe put blood on the, uh, you know, whatever you got to do. <laughs> but the actual, in actuality, there's that within me that's like, I don't want to kill anything. <laughs> I just don't naturally like, uh, you know, I got to do it to be a man. Come on, sometime I got to go hunting. But I'm just saying, I don't naturally like death and killing and all that kind of stuff. Here's what I like, Philippians 4, 8. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely... Death and all that stuff is not lovely. Whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So those are the kind of things we're supposed to put in our mind, not death and gore and all this kind of stuff. Psalm uh, 11, if you would. Psalm 11. I would just quote this to you, but I didn't write it down. Psalm 11, verse 5, says, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked... And him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. God doesn't want somebody who just loves violence, okay, and gore and death. And, and maybe that has nothing to do with it. But in my mind, when I think about the Nazarite, Nazarite vow, one of the things they said I'm going to stay away from is any dead things, dead bodies. Even their own mother or father, they weren't allowed to go into during this time where they're supposed to be separated unto God and in the, in, uh, in trying their best to... Uh, uh, to please him. And so maybe that is a possibility. And finally, the last one, this is the one that Samson is the most known for, is the long hair, which everybody thinks gave him the power. Uh, his hair was just hair. <laughs> the Holy Spirit gave him the power. Okay. But did you notice back in verse, uh, let's hold your place there. Or did I tell you to turn anywhere? No. Okay. Go back to uh, <laughs> number six again. Number six, and if you notice, uh, I marked it. I have to look at my. As we're reading through this, jumped out at me. Uh, verse seven, he shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. Now, really, that doesn't have anything to do with the hair. But I actually think, and we're gonna, I'm going to try to hopefully make this clear in a second, the power, the, the having, not cutting his hair, I think, was actually symbolic of being covered, okay? Having God as his authority. And so I think that's what he's talking about, having the uh, consecration of God upon his head maybe is somewhat of a reference to not cutting his hair. But look, there's nothing special about the hair. There's, it's just God gave him power. If you, I've heard of people, uh, there was this guy who likes to run the ultra marathons like I do, except for he's like the elite. He's way better than I am. Uh, and he runs in mountains and all that. And he ran the Western States 100. It's a really well-known 100-mile race. And he ran that and he won seven times. And his hair kept getting longer and longer and longer because he had decided not to cut it until he, until he you know, stops running that race or he loses the race or something. Now, I don't think he made any kind of superstitious connection, but a lot of people were like, oh, it's like Samson. His power is in his hair. <laughs> right? And I've heard of other people do that too. Like, I'm not going to cut my hair. Uh, it's like a good luck charm or something like that. Look, your, your hair is not... Look, let me tell you something about superstition. No good luck charms have any luck to them. <laughs> <laughs> None of the, the way you, I know baseball players like to wear their caps backwards or something like that. It's not bringing you luck, okay? <laughs> it's just all in your head. But God is the one that has the ultimate power to be able to do these things. And it was, the, it was just his de decision basically to bless Samson. And look, Br Samson broke all the rules anyway. Uh, but God decided whenever it was time for him to use him, he, uh, he would, the Holy Spirit would come upon him and he'd be able to do these things. So let's think about this. If Jesus drank from the fruit of the vine, if he came at a dead body, what makes us think he didn't cut his hair? <laughs> and the people cut their hair back in the Bible days. In fact, I proved that in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. I remember one time reading commentary. This is before I really had done a whole lot of study and talking about why people aren't supposed to have long hair. And, uh, but I remember reading something that said, we know that Jesus didn't have long hair. And I was like, well, how can we really know that? 
And they made reference to this verse and they said, do you think the same disciple that, uh, uh, or do you think Paul would have wrote this in 1 Corinthians if he knew that Jesus had long hair? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's an interesting point, right? 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Oh, let's see here. Verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Now let's stop right there. I've heard people say, no, what do you mean nature? See, this is where the Bible's wrong. Nature doesn't teach us that because, look, some of the, some of the animals in the wild, the males are the ones with the long hair. Nature doesn't teach us that. Well, that's misunderstanding what it means by nature. It's kind of like the people that say, look, homosexuality is natural. Look, some of the animals do it. Well, guess what? We're not animals. <laughs> right? And so uh, that's a misunderstanding what the Bible says when it says it's not natural. What they're saying is that it's not normal for a human being to do that. Right? It's not saying, look at all nature, you know, and, and that's how we should, or we should act. No, and that's not what he's saying at all. Okay, so here's what he's saying about the hair. It should be natural within a man to say, I need short hair. It should be natural within a woman to say, I need long hair. I don't know why. That's just what God said. So I believe him. <laughs> right? And what I have noticed, and I've shared this before. I don't want to make too much, too big of a deal out of it. But what I've noticed before is when a woman uh, begins to get uh, kind of, uh, what do you call it? I don't want to say women's lib, but just kind of that, that desire to just like rise up and I don't need no man or whatever. Oftentimes the first thing to go is the hair. Just cut that hair off. Right? And I don't know what that is, or shave it, or whatever. And, uh, and look, here's what, here's what I think. Uh, not that it necessarily matters what I think, but, but here's when it, let's, let's read this first, and then I'll tell you. 1 Corinthians, uh, we already read it. Uh, Does not nature itself uh, teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Now, some people say it's a sin unto him. Okay, This is my understanding. If it was a sin, then why would God tell people when they take the Nazarite vow to not to cut their hair? He'd be telling them to sin. So that doesn't make sense to me, but it doesn't say it's a sin. It says it's a shame, right? It's a shame unto him to have long hair. And so in actuality, what the men that were under the Nazarite vow were doing is humbling themselves and being kind of ashamed to walk around with their hair not cut. Right, because naturally, what they wanted to do is to cut it and to and to present themselves in a reasonable way. So, uh, so here it begins to explain a little bit in First Corinthians why this is the case. Okay, but if a woman have long hair, it is her glory. I'm sorry, it is a glory to her, for her hair is giving her for a covering. Right, a woman should feel almost like. Uh, naked without her hair. Like something's not meant. I, this is supposed to be a covering. I'm not saying it has to be so long that it physically covers the body or something like that. I'm just saying it was given as a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the church of God. Uh, he's saying, look, we don't have, it. this is the way it is. If I understand that right, what he's saying is if you want, if you're looking for another way, we don't have another way. This is, this is it. This is, this is how things are going to go. And so actually, uh, if you back up, it talks a little bit more about why this is, okay? Uh, and it says, uh, let me see, verse 7. Uh, man, let's just read. Let's just read from verse 5, okay? It's talking about praying and prophesying. But every woman that pray, prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Now, who is the head of the woman? The Bible already made, said that in this text. Uh, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of the man is Christ, up there in verse uh, two, uh, 3. And so he's saying that the, 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 the woman is honoring to her head, which is her husband, by having her hair covered. Let her also, uh, but if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven... Let her be covered. So if you're going to cut your hair, that's just, I mean, to, I'm not talking about at all cut it, but I'm saying if you're just going to chop it off, whatever, have short hair, that's just, dis, just as dishonoring as if it was shaven. Okay, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Oh, well, I'm sorry, verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, 
for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now, what does all this mean? Here's what I think the idea is. And it makes more sense when you think about the Nazarite vow. Okay? The, the woman having her head covered is actually a sign. Remember, it goes back to what I said about women when they uh, want to rise up against, I don't need any man in my life, and I am woman, you know, uh, hear me roar, whatever. What do they want to do? They want to cut their hair off, right? And actually, there's a sense in, in which they're saying, hey, I am not under any man. So actually, by having the hair covered, they're actually showing a sense in which they're in submission, right? Huh? And when they have their head covered, I don't know what I said. Hair covered. <laughs> uh, when they have their head covered, it's showing that they're in submission. Now, I believe that that's true for clothing as well. When a woman covers herself with clothing in such a way where it looks like they're being submissive to... Now, some people might not like that, but I just think that that's the idea that the Bible is saying, that the women are supposed to be in subjection. Now, don't think that that means, oh, guys, yeah, we're just running. No, what he's saying is, okay, so guys are supposed to be directly taking their petitions to God, directly prophesying, directly. This is why the woman is not supposed to uh, preach in the church or, or make, you know, teach and, and, and instruct everybody in the church, right? Because that's the, during the assembly, when we all meet together, that's the man that is in charge. That's his job. And this is offensive in our world today, but this is just what the Bible says. We need to get back to that. But the idea here with the Nazarite vow is now you've got a guy right, who's under this vow. Remember, he's in this like fasting state. And he's only under this vow for so long, but during this time he's got to do without certain things. Well, what he's also doing is he's allowing his hair to come out. And I think that the picture there is that he's saying, look, I am in servitude to, the, to God. Now, we're all in servitude to God, but I think he's saying, look, I am... Uh, I am being submissive here. Okay, I'm being a servant. And it actually comes with a sense of shame because I'm a guy and I'm not supposed to have long hair. It's a whole lot easier to preach uh, this message whenever all the guys in here have haircuts. <laughs> but I'm just saying uh, uh, there are guys who like to have long hair and they don't see anything wrong with it. But the Bible says that it is a shame and each, even nature should uh, teach us that. Okay, so... Uh, I don't believe it's a sin to have to for the guy to have long hair, but it is a shame. Okay, and really, in all honesty, uh, should we ever really want to walk around as Christians just being a shame all the time? No, of course not. We want to be respectful, uh, respected, I guess, in the sense of of, uh, of being serious and being. Being able to directly preach the truth, directly go to God. You see, understand, that's kind of the authority that a man has. And again, that's why he's not supposed to have his head covered. But in this case, under this vow, he was supposed to. Okay, And especially, as we saw there, in the uh, presence of the Lord, right? Prophesying, praying, doing whatever. Uh, we, we don't want to be in shame like that. That's why as soon as they were done with that vow, they would shave their head and then they would go back uh, to their business. All right, there's one uh, last thing in regards to that, is that really, if you think about it, any time we come before the Lord, there's a sense in which we say, you know what, this is serious business. I ought to be uh, uh, kind of cleansed, sanctified, ready to meet with God, right? And so let's look at just a couple verses in closing about this. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. And look at verse 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. And let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Uh, whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it. 
uh, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, uh, whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. God's saying, this is holy, kind of like Moses, take off your shoes, this is holy ground. He's, he's, he's bound, putting boundaries around his place and saying, all this spot right here is holy and sanctified unto me. And one of the things he said was that the people need to wash their clothes, right, and be sanctified. And for three days, uh, they're supposed to make sure that they're clean, uh, <clears throat> In any way, he, then Moses begins to tell them some other things that they need to do as well. Look at Genesis, turn back a little ways, Genesis 35. We see something very similar. Genesis 35. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, that's the house of God, right? And dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that were among you, and be clean. And then he says, And change your garments, and let us arise and go to Bethel. You see the sense of where he's saying, We want to step it up. I mean, put away your idols. I mean, that, that should go without saying. <laughs> before you go to, Put away your idols, and then even wash up. Wash, be clean, be, uh, be neat, right? And so I think this idea of, uh, you know, even in the presence of God, right, we want to make sure that we're not uh, shameful and all like, like these guys were during this time of their vow, which it said was a shame for them to have long hair. Uh, anyway, I hope that makes sense, kind of a different type of a lesson. I mean, I don't think anybody's planning on taking the Nazarite vow anytime soon, but I think uh, hopefully you can understand why some of those things might be, and then how maybe we're not supposed to be necessarily forbidding grapes and for staying away from dead bodies and, and uh, cutting our hair and all that, or not cutting our hair. Maybe we're not supposed to do those things necessarily, but you might kind of understand where God expects certain things uh, from us, uh, particularly whenever we're coming to Him for something. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you uh, for your word. Help us to live uh, our lives, not necessarily making vows, but let our yeas be yeas and our nays nays and, and uh, help us live our life uh, to serve you, walking in the Spirit and denying the lust of the flesh. Lord, pray you be pleased uh, with us and, uh, and uh, we just want to uh, lift you up and have your, uh, your will and way done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand.